school readings. So, when I was asked the question of, well, what, you know, what makes us glow, which I was told was the topic, I didn't immediately think of it as a very individual point, but rather as a more general point. I started thinking about what ma has made people really glow, right? And to this, to, to me, this inspired me to think about a fire, really, and you know, what burns a fire in your heart and all that. And I thought about, therefore, what people sacrifice for. What are the things that people are willing to give up what they love because they love something more, right? Because that's how you distinguish your priorities. So I started to think about it. One thing that seemed to come to mind quite often was this idea of freedom, right? And as a matter of fact, while thinking about this, a particular picture did come to mind, with which I will be showing now. So, so this was certainly something that, uh, this is certainly a cry that has been on the lips of many dying men, it seems, throughout time and, and women, and has been something that people have sacrificed a great deal for. But what are they actually sacrificing? If there is something that someone loves so dearly, then it must be worth something. So you're at the very least to them, right? So it is worth investigating, therefore, what exactly that thing is. Now, when it comes to freedom, we often try to think about sort of what are our masters, right? But really what we need to do when we're looking at freedom is look at the decision points. An interesting idea was once made to me, an uh, interesting point was once made to me, which was that when you are threatened, you have not two, one of two options. You don't have either refuse or accept what they tell you, but you have a whole variety of options, right? There is no one who can truly put you in a situation where there are only two things that you can do. You always have different, many different options. And it's about that decision-making process that truly defines whether or not you're making your own decisions. I thought, well, that makes sense as an idea of freedom, but what does that actually mean? I had to challenge this idea slightly um, because a lot of decisions are made beforehand, a long time before they're actually carried out. Now, there are some examples of freedom that, and perhaps not being, someone being not so free that I'd like to look at. The first one would be someone from a very long time ago. Uh, a young boy in... Uh, a, a young boy uh, was once, his, his city was destroyed, right? His nation was defeated in, in battle, right? And he was taken to be a slave by the most powerful king of that time, taken to be a trophy, um, and taken to the center of his power. He had no main means of escape. He had no means of communication with any of the people he used to know. He had no hope of escape at all, and he was completely in the power of the king. And we would think, well, that would be an example of someone who's not free, right? You know, that, that's like a slave, but this is like a, you know, the, he has no chance of possibly becoming free. But when he was asked to, to give up his morals, in what we would think is a relatively small matter, he was asked to eat from the king's table, which was actually a blessing at the time. Um, he refused. Uh, this king was King Nebuchadnezzar, in fact. Um, and he was an incredibly powerful king at the time. This was almost an insult to him. But we could see, despite this enormous power of this king, he was unable to truly dominate David. David. He, never, he, never had this, he never had him completely under his control. He remained free throughout his life. Now, there's another example that I was thinking about because I once listened to a nihilistic speaker uh, who, was, who was speaking. He, they were asked the question of why did they do anything? What, what was their purpose for going? And they said, well... They asked themselves the same question when they decided to become a nihilist, and they came to the conclusion that the answer was nothing. So what they did was they went, and they lay in their bed, and they did exactly that, nothing. For a short while, until they realized that they were hungry. And then they were like, well, I'll go make myself a sandwich. So that's exactly what they did. And then they ate the sandwich, quite predictably. But then they realized something um, quite, quite quickly, was the fact that their sandwich-eating habits were going to require funding. So they were not going to be able to simply stop working, but they were going to have to continue working. And from that, they built the rest of their life. Now, to them, they felt that they were describing freedom, you know, like this sort of this, this breaking free. But in reality, what you, the more observant of you may have noted, and it took me a while to note, was that they had been describing themselves being dominated by their own nature, a tyrant they would carry around with them in their own flesh that they could never escape. No matter how far they ran, no matter how long they lived, there was no escape from this because this was within themselves. This was their own nature. And they had, they had given themselves up to it, and they hadn't even chosen willingly. They weren't even aware. So 
there are different examples of people being free versus being slaves, right? It's not always obvious to us on the outside looking in at their circumstance to see if someone is truly free or not. So we have to think about what actually is happening here. Uh, this one. So I'm going to be doing a bit of pointing here. Uh, so we're going to start in the middle. Um, by the way, the way the hierarchy of this uh, goes the labels from top to bottom, or you could look at the circles and go from the center being the highest point of hierarchy outward. Um, but further out is more common to see. So you've got your, I, I called it your purpose. There are probably better words for it that I do not know. But this is supposed to be sort of your, when everything else goes, why are you still going? You know, when everything else is lost, why are you still going? If everything you did failed and you had nothing, would there be anything left to build? And the answer would pr probably be yes for most people. So this is why I included this. And I think this is very important to people. Then you have your fundamental assumptions. Now, anyone who believes they do not make any assumptions, I would challenge that. Because, for example, you assume that the rules are the same yesterday as they are today. Right? All of you, quite confidently, are sitting on the chairs that you are now sitting on, assuming that they will hold your weight just as they did before the interval, well, that's an assumption. <laughs> Who's to say that they are to continue on with the rules? Do you know the future? Well, you can predict it, but that's based on the past. We all have these assumptions, and we build our life on them, and they're very, very fundamental to us. They're not like the normal assumptions we make. Then you have your subconscious. Now, here, from here, it's sometimes hard to see, but from here, you get things like your emotions. This is how I'm categorizing it. These are not your knee-jerk reactions. Often your subconscious, people can follow their subconscious without realizing. They can be biased in their decisions based on their subconscious. And they can affect their subconscious without intending to. So this is quite a, a wild card, and it impacts you massively. Then you have your conscious. Now, your conscience is really, really interesting. Because this is quite far out. It, you know, you don't, I don't think anyone can say that they can just decide, well, I'm just going to change what I'm feeling today completely at a whim. Um, or that I'm just going to change myself completely at a whim, right, for, from one day to the next without some kind of preparation for it or without some kind of... It's, it's just, it's, we don't have that kind of control or that kind of power in our conscience. However, it has the power of preparation and forethought, and it actually is probably the most useful part, I think we could all agree, of, of your mind in terms of what you do with it, though you do need the other thing. And this tends to come out in your practices. This is what you do. This is the friends you'll surround yourself with. These are your habits. And these things impact you massively. Now, when we make a decision, we have to decide what are we going to prioritize, right? We look at our purpose. We try to discern what it is. And then we, based on how we are seeing the world and our fundamental assumptions, we try to use our conscious to predict what, or we, or we just do what we, our gut instinct tells us to in our subconscious, or we go for what our conscience tells us is the right thing to do, right? We try to predict what we should be doing. And then this comes out in our practices. Now, there's an important idea with, with this whole thing of freedom, right? Which is that, which, which is the idea of truth. Now, I'm sure we've all been lied to at some point. Maybe some of you have even been manipulated. Um, and, and it's not a very nice thing to happen. But you don't truly really feel like you make a decision if you make a decision based on false information, right? If someone judged you as if you'd made decision with full knowledge of what would happen um, when, you, when you had no way to know that, you would feel that that was unfair. Right? And that's a perfectly reasonable thing to say because at the end of the day, we make, our, we make our decisions as best we can with the knowledge we have available. And if we have truth available, then we're making the right decision. However, we all also have one thing that is very hard to get away from, which is the fact that we all have a purpose. Now, I didn't talk about a purpose very much earlier, um, or as much as I could have, but a purpose is really important because if you, and a purpose can be a collection of things, but a purpose, I, I'm, I'm just using the word to describe what you're holding most highly, um, regardless of whether or not you know it. Now, your purpose seems to me to be largely what, what dictates your decision. At the end of the day, you know, if you're going to do one thing or another, you're going to be following what you hold most highly, right? You're not going to trade something that you don't value 
for something, something that you value for something that you don't value knowingly, intentionally. Everything we do seems sensible to us at the time that we do it. So, with that in mind, we can say what freedom is now. Uh, we can say freedom is being able to choose our purpose, where we're going, based on truth. However, now you may ask a question, which might seem counterintuitive for the moment, but it can, be, it can be a fair question to ask at times, especially when we have to sacrifice things like security and comfort for the sake of our freedoms. And sometimes it's very hard to stay free, especially when it's so much more convenient to just not think, because this requires an enormous amount of emotional and intellectual force sometimes. Um, for example, with David, where he had to choose to follow, to choose what he was going to follow, despite the unknown and, and quite possibly disastrous consequences. So this can be difficult. So why is it worth it? So I chose this picture. I don't know if you'll all agree, but a human chooses what they, who they're going to be, right? They, they choose who they're going towards, right? They don't always choose what they are at the minute or what they've done in the past. They, they have chosen that already. That's not no longer their domain of control. But what they are going to be, where they are going towards, we do have some influence over. And that's where we should be working. That's where we should be fighting, really. So uh, what does, but compare that to an animal, right? Earlier I said you can choose to focus and make your decisions based on your subconscious or on your conscience. Now, if you base it in your subconscious, what distinguishes you from an animal, in, in all honesty? It's not a lot. You know, in the, in the case of the, uh, the nihilistic speaker, they were doing whatever felt right to them at the time. They were hungry, they go eat. All right, quite predictable. But they didn't even realize that they were choosing a master. Right. I mean, you know, most, most animals do the same. And that might have been what they wanted to go towards, but they got there. And at the end of the day, that's not where we should be going. Now, as humans, however, we can choose to go after a nobler purpose, and many people have. And we could even call them heroes. These are often people who we look up to, even if we disagree with the specifics of what they're fighting for. We can recognize things of courage. We can recognize things of purity. We can recognize things of selflessness. We can recognize a lot of these things where people have decided that they're going to work for be a small part of something a lot bigger, and that they know that that's what they are, and that's what they're going towards. And when someone does that, they become a real force of their own. Regardless of the power of that force, that doesn't really matter. Because at the end of the day, autonomy, absolute autonomy, is not only something that no one has, but something that doesn't actually change who you are. Freedom is a different field, and it's about choosing which way you're going towards, regardless of the size of the steps you can take. Thank you for listening.